Good morning. Welcome to worship on this third Sunday in Lent. Uh, and a special welcome <clears throat> also to those who are joining us through the webcast and through the radio and through the, tele to the television, Arvig Channel 14, I believe. Good to have you with us this morning. It's good to be together. I want to thank uh, all those who have a part in putting the worship service together and uh, helping us worship. Uh, Russ Bunker, our director of worship and music, and all the musicians that uh, are, are here Sunday after Sunday to, to enrich our, our worship. We thank the greeters. We thank the ushers. We thank the, uh, the readers. Uh, we thank those who are volunteering today to serve the Coffee Fellowship after the worship service. And uh, we thank the, uh, the audio and the visual technicians who, who do such a marvelous and mysterious job up there in the, in the balcony Sunday after Sunday. Uh, you know, there's no end to the number of people that we could thank. We could thank the janitors. Uh, they have the uh, facil facility ready for worship for us on Sunday mornings. And, of course, then there's also the, um, the secretaries who does a, do such a meticulous job in preparing the, the bulletin each week. So lots of people to thank. Um, when I thank the musicians, we want to remember a former musician here at Calvary who helped with the choirs uh, for many years, Hazel Horningschmidt. I just received word this morning that she had a massive stroke and is at the hospital here in Purim and is maybe not likely to recover from that stroke. So we remember her in our prayers this morning, Hazel Horningschmidt. Um, please take an opportunity to read the announcements as you have an opportunity to do that this morning or sometime uh, later today. Uh, this was handed to me this morning that there's going to be a, an opportunity to hear from the parents of the young man who, 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 whose heart was received by Leroy Wigsheed. Um, and he's going to be, the parents are going to be speaking at uh, St. Lawrence Catholic Church after the 1030 Mass this next Sunday, the 30th, and there'll be coffee and rolls served uh, at that, uh, at that um, event. So be aware of that. Um, a special reminder <clears throat> that next Sunday is also the community's song fest. It got rescheduled for this coming uh, next Sunday, but it'll include choirs from various uh, churches in our area, and then there'll be plenty of opportunity for some good, good uh, hymn singing as well. A reminder that we're trying to observe an applause-free Lent. We aren't doing a very good job of it. We, we keep falling back into our old habits and old patterns of clapping, but... Uh, we're going to try to do that, so find other ways to say thanks to those uh, who share their, their talents in so many ways. And then, uh, of course, we're going to continue with the noisy offering in keeping with the solemn nature of our Lenten season. We have, <laughs> have this noisy offering that will be taken by the children, but it's for a good cause. It's for, for world hunger. Let's uh, take a deep breath center ourselves and prepare for, for, for worship at this time. Please stand as you are able and join in the confession of sin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. 
Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, for, for the peace of the whole world, for the peace from above, and for the un our salvation, let us pray. For the peace of the, from above, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, 
take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. God of transparency, your Son Jesus spoke openly to the world, even when his life was in danger. Give us courage to speak our truth to the world, despite our fears, for the sake of him who is truth, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Thank you, choir. Very lovely. We have some children with us this morning. Any children? Oh, my goodness. No kids in there in church this morning here at the first service. Well, we'll have to forego the children's sermon, I think, this morning. We'll, uh, we'll do that. We'll just forego the children's sermon, and uh, we'll... We do have some? Hey, okay. One lone young man. You got to take the offering all by yourself this morning, huh? What's your name? Joe. Joe? Nice to meet you, Joe. Let me tell you a little bit about when I was about your age. How old are you? About seven, eight? Um, I'm ten. You're ten now? Okay. I was a little younger than you were, but I was a, I was a kind of an inquisitive child when I was young. You want to sit down? That's fine. And I'd, I, I like to know how things worked, and so I take things apart, and then I put them back together again. Sometimes there were parts left over. But I was kind of that way. And when I was about maybe a little younger than you were, six or seven, eight, I, uh, I stumbled across a saw that my dad had bought, a hand saw. I thought, ooh, that's kind of cool. And I'd seen him using that saw. He was cutting some boards with it. And so one day I went down to the basement, I found that saw, and I thought, hmm, this sounds like, this looks like it'd be kind of fun to play with. I wonder if I could find something that I could saw. I looked around, I couldn't see any wood. And so finally I came, brought it up, upstairs, and I went out the, the, the back door to the, this long, narrow deck that we had across the back of the house. And here was this railing, it was made out of wood. I thought, Ooh, I saw wood, perfect. And so I tested the saw by sawing on the railing of the, of, the, of the porch. I didn't saw it all the way through, but I saw it enough to really have, have some fun and seeing how that saw could really make a cut. Well, then I thought, oh, I, th- I don't suppose I should have done that. And I went and I put the saw back, but uh, I left the evidence, you know, the sawdust on the, on, the, on, the, on the porch. And so sure enough, that night, my dad confronted me. Did you take my saw, and did you saw in my, on the railing of the back porch? Do you know what I said? I said, no. <laughs> no. I, I can't imagine who did that. I said, are, are, you, are you sure? It looks like a very fresh cut, and, and there hasn't been anybody over here at the house all day long. I'm, I'm pretty sure it might be you that did it. Are you sure you didn't do it? No, nope. I didn't do it. And then my dad said, well, he, says, he said, I, I, I'm not, if you did it, I'm not going to punish you for it. I just want you to tell me the truth. It's going to mean more to me that you tell me the truth than anything. Are you sure you, you're not the one that saw it on the porch railing? He says, no, it wasn't me. And I remember that, to, to, you know, to this day I remember that very well, that I didn't tell my dad the truth. You know, do you know what I missed out on because I wouldn't tell my dad the truth? What did I miss out on because I didn't tell the truth? Um. Ice cream, somebody said? <laughs> Possibly so. Uh, what, I, what I missed out on was hearing my God tell me that it's okay, you're forgiven. It was a childish thing that you did. It wasn't right. You did some damage to the back porch, but it's okay. I love you anyway, and I forgive you. I didn't hear him say that. In all my years, you know, I've been, I've been missing that, that, that word of forgiveness for my dad because I wouldn't own up to what I did. I wouldn't tell the truth. I think there's a, a lesson there for us all, you know, a lesson for us all. It's good to be, have that freedom to tell the truth, you know, knowing that, that um, there can be forgiveness for, our, for, for when we make mistakes and when we do foolish things, and then we can start over again. Let's pray. Will you play with me? Gracious God, we give you thanks that we can come to you with all of the things that don't go right in our lives, our weaknesses, our mistakes, our sins, and we have the freedom to, to, to speak the truth to you and to one another. We thank you that when we do that, you are there to give us a new chance, a new beginning, to wipe, wipe clean the slate, give us forgiveness, and help us to start new. We ask these things in in Jesus' name, amen.
Thanks for coming up today, Joel. The first reading is from Psalm 17, verses 1 through 7. A prayer of David. Hear a just cause, O Lord. Attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From you let my vindication come. Let your eyes see the right. If you try my heart, if you visit me by night, if you test me, you will find no wickedness in me. My mouth does not transgress. As for what others do, by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior, of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. The word of the Lord. Please stand. The second reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 12 through 27. Glory to you, Lord. So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to an ass, who was the father-in-law of Caliphas, the high priest that year. Caliphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had taken a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing around it warming themselves. Peter was also standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. If I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then I asked, sent him bound to Caliphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. The word of the Lord.
I realized that I forgot the, uh, the noise offering. Maybe we can take that after the hymn of the day. We'll, uh, maybe Joe and some other volunteers can help to do that. Can you? Okay. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The first thing that, that jumps out at me in the reading that we just heard from John chapter 18 is the very stark contrast that we have here between Peter and Jesus. Peter, on the one hand, is, is behaving in a very cowardly way, while Jesus is fearless, he is completely unapologetic about what he has taught and what he stands for. Peter, standing in the courtyard of the high priest, denies his friendship with Jesus, denies that he is one of his disciples. You're one of his disciples, aren't you? The woman who admitted him in through that gate to the courtyard asked. No, no, uh, you must have me confused with somebody else. And a bit later, others huddled around the charcoal fire ask him if he isn't also one of Jesus' disciples, one of his followers. Again, Peter says, no, no, not me. Then one of the high priest's slaves who had been in the garden when Jesus was arrested asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. He denied it. Peter caves. His fears get the best of him. He sees what's happening to his Lord. And he knows where it's going. He's quite certain that it's not going to end well. And to be honest, he doesn't want the same fate to fall upon him. Who can blame him? Who can blame him? At this point in the story, you know, Peter can't see how a, a crucified Messiah or for that matter, a crucified Peter, could possibly serve God's plan. Meanwhile, inside, Jesus answers the high priest's questions, well, I'd say with a bit of attitude. He stands firm in what he has openly taught. Why do you question me about my disciples and about my teachings? What I have said is, is no secret whatsoever. I spoke openly in the synagogue. I spoke openly in the temple. Ask anyone who heard me. They'll tell you what I said. Well, it's not that the power boys of the temple didn't know what Jesus taught. They knew. Trouble was, they didn't like it. They were threatened by Jesus' radical teachings. Quite a contrast, don't you think? Peter wimps out, afraid for his own life, while Jesus goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Caiaphas, the high priest, and he gets a fist in the face for his insolence. Peter is distancing himself from his Lord, while Jesus, knowing the inevitability of his death, is holding firm to his testimony, leaving no room for negotiation, no room for compromise. I am who I am. I said what I said. Now John's narrative doesn't say anything more about Peter, interestingly enough, until after the resurrection. Mark, however, tells us that when the rooster crowed, uh, prompting Peter to remember Jesus' prediction that he would deny him three times that night, what did Peter do? He broke down and he wept. He wept bitterly. He feels tremendous shame. He feels utterly lost. He had every good intention to be strong, to be brave, to be full of courage, to be loyal to Jesus. Though all the rest fall away, said Peter, I will not. I will stay and I will defend you. I will protect you. I won't... I won't run away in the face of danger. Well, so much for good intentions. How wrong he had been about himself. Yes, it was just as Jesus said. Jesus knew Peter better than Peter knew himself. This wasn't the first time Peter had to eat his words, of course. 
What about that night on the Sea of Galilee when the terrible storm came up very suddenly? The disciples all thought that they would drown for sure. Then in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the storm on the water, Jesus appeared, walking toward the boat. Who is it? What is it? Is it a ghost? What is it? And then Peter announced. He announced himself. Jesus announced himself. It is I, said Jesus. It is I. Well, Peter responded immediately. He said, if it is you, Lord, let me come out to you on the water. What a crazy thing to say. What a crazy thing he did. Who was he trying to impress anyway? Well, out of the boat he stepped, full of faith, actually walking on the water. Amazing. How fearless and brave he felt. At least for a few seconds, he felt fearless and brave. And then the force of the storm distracted him, causing him to doubt. The size of the waves and the wind overcame him. His faith gave way. His faith cracked as his fear got the best of him. Peter the rock. Jesus said he was the rock. I call you the rock. Cephas, the rock. Yeah, he was the rock, all right. The sinking rock. Down he sank, crying out, Save me, Lord, save me. And suddenly, Jesus' hand reached out and grabbed hold of Peter and pulled him up. How embarrassing for Peter. And yet what an important lesson he learned that night about his own weakness and about the hand of Jesus, always strong and always ready to save. Peter's heart must have been flooded by so many memories that night of Jesus' arrest. As he watched from the shadows as Jesus was dragged before the high priest and then brought before Pilate, the governor, the Roman governor. And as he was tortured and as he was stripped and flogged and mocked and finally was sentenced to death at the insistence of an angry mob. And all the while he felt so helpless and so unworthy, so unable to be the person that, that he wanted to be. But Peter must have felt, feels horribly familiar, doesn't it? For you and I are no less guilty than Peter. His failure is our failure too. Our denials perhaps have not been so dramatic and certainly not documented for all of the world to read about. But we betray him, our Lord, and we deny him just the same. How easily we capitulate, just like Peter. Maybe you heard the story about the lad who was, who was raised in a very devout Christian home. And it was time for him to leave home. He had graduated from school. But the only work that he could find was, you know, as a lumberjack way up in the north woods of Minnesota. Well, his parents were concerned about him taking that job. They were concerned how he would fit in living with those notoriously irreverent, rough, crude, tough, worldly men in the lumber camp. His parents were concerned that he might be picked on, that he might be bullied, that he might be made fun of because of his sincere Christian faith. Well, off he went. And a year later, the young man returned home, and his parents were naturally very curious as to how he got along up there in that lumber camp with all those other bloggers. They asked, did, did they harass you? Did they make fun of you because of your, your love for Jesus? No, the boy said, it was really no problem. They never found out. <laughs> Oh, I will be loyal to you, Lord Jesus. And we say it with such conviction. But when there's a cost, when there's a cost, then all bets are off. When loyalty to Jesus calls for some real sacrifices from us, well, that's about when we decide it's time to bail out. I love you, Lord, but I love myself and I love my privileges. 
more. I love you, Lord, but I don't want to love my enemies. I don't want to be too generous. I don't want to jeopardize my standing in the community. I don't want to give too much of my time. I love you, Lord, but, but I have all these reservations, you see. You call me to be a servant of all, but I rather like being served. I do love my comforts. We start to see this about ourselves precisely because Jesus keeps coming after us. The closer he comes to us, the less comfortable you know, is our sinful self. His very existence threatens our own. Here comes Jesus invading the space where I am in control, where I rule. Here comes Jesus, the light of the world, exposing all the secret places I keep my sins hidden. Here comes Jesus, questioning all of the time-honored ways that I practice my religion and exposing all of my hypocrisies, the clever ways that I use faith as a weapon against others or use religion as a self-entitlement for myself, a selfish entitlement for myself. Yes, I can certainly see how the Jewish leaders were threatened by Jesus and why they must destroy him before he undermines everything that, by which they define themselves. And there is this about ourselves. We are very good at hiding our sins from ourselves. But then one day we cannot escape the terrible truth. It comes crashing down on us like a ton of bricks. We see our own weakness with painful clarity. Woe is me. Woe is me, we cry out. And if that isn't overwhelming enough, the unexpected love that we meet in Jesus is even more overwhelming. Before him, we sense a profound unworthiness. And I think what makes him so hard to take is that our Lord Jesus is so unfathomably good and merciful. It's hard on our pride. He is hard on our pride. On that part of us that doesn't much like receiving charity. This is what makes our many subtle acts of betrayal and denial you know, even more shameful. It's not like Jesus were a, a harsh taskmaster. It's not as though he were a, a vindictive Lord bent on punishing those who, who don't toe the mark or getting even with those who cave in to self interest or, or to peer pressure. Jesus' very goodness, his very selfless love, it both indicts us and it also saves us. Who can ever be worthy of such a love as this? Not a one, not a one in all the world. Come to think of it, how is it that we know so much about Peter's dark night of denials? It is no doubt because he was later willing to confess the events of that night to others. He undoubtedly told the story again and again, you know, like an alcoholic at an AA meeting tells of the hurt that he has caused other people and caused himself. And how only by the grace of God and A.A., is he alive today? <laughs> Peter didn't try to minimize or excuse, excuse his cowardice. He didn't try to hide it from the world. He confessed it openly and in great detail, yet not as a confession of despair, but as a great witness to the reconciling love of Christ. Think about it. We would not dare confess our sins if we did not have Jesus' goodness and mercy to count on. It is the very self-sacrificing love of Christ that makes our confession 
possible, that gives us the freedom to make the good confession. It was for us that he gave himself, and from his suffering, our hearts, that his, that, that from his suffering, our hearts might be opened really to new depths of honesty and humble gratitude. Our gain through his loss, forgiveness through his sacrifice, life for us through his death. The great Lenten hymn, Beneath the Cross of Jesus, I think puts it very well. And from my contrite heart with tears, two wonders I confess. The wonder of his glorious love and my unworthiness. Amen. Where's Joe? You want to come help me with the noisy offering? We're going to take it now because I forgot it when I should have called for it. These are the ones that make the good noise right here, these metal ones. I'll give you one of the metal ones, Joe. Oh, we have another one. Good. Can we help out? That's awesome. Thank you. More volunteers? Okay. Who hasn't seen a, who hasn't had a chance yet to, are you covered over here? You covered over here? Okay, that's great. Okay. Yeah, bring it down and pour it in and make some noise. Ah, sounds good. And here comes Joe. Okay. Come on down, Joe. Oh, you got a good... See, we don't think any, any less of you if you put in paper. You want to pour it in there? Thank you so much. Okay, that's it. Good. Great.
Please stand if you are able. Let's join together in professing our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Continue with the offering. Pray. 
redeeming God, we give you thanks for this opportunity to gather as your people, for the freedom you give us to confess our sins, weaknesses, failures, and regrets, and for your great mercy and kindness revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant that we might die each day to our sinning ways and be raised daily in Christ's redeeming love to walk in newness of life. Great God, we pray for the various ministries carried out in and through this congregation and its members. Thank you for the rich variety of gifts that you raise up. Strengthen all your people in their resolve to glorify you through serving others. Grant that each of us may live, in, live and work with a sense of mission and high purpose by serving your kingdom goals. God of all goodness and life-giving gifts, we pray for our friends, for our neighbors, and for family members who are struggling with illness and with sorrow and with hardship, and especially those we now name in our hearts before you. And for the family of Diane and Ron, Buckhouse, as they grieve the loss of Ron's sister, Donna Schmitz, last night. We pray also for Hazel Honing Schmidt as she lingers at the hospital after suffering a severe stroke. Grant them healing, grant them strength, grant them comfort, hope, and joy in your presence. We pray for our youth and adult leaders now beginning their service in Guatemala. We pray that you would hold them in safety, close to your heart, and bless their work to the praise of your glory. Whatever else you see that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of your awesome goodness and kindness. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.